first job was at uh, Kent State, but uh, we're very happy to have stolen him. Uh, mm -hmm. You came in 2016, so this is your second. second. This is the start of second year. Start of your second year. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he's an expert in things like GIS and geocomputing, uh, agent-based modeling, and other things that we'll hear about today. He's published in all the best uh, GIS and geography journals, and has uh, or has had funding from NSF and probably other places that I don't know about. Um, he, uh, because his services are in such demand, uh, he's got to publish on cool things like the American Red Cross mobile app user trends. Uh, maize and soybean yields and the geography of Twitter, which is <laughs> all cooler than the things that I, that I publish on. But until now, he's never had an NPC seminar month. That's so, true. <laughs> That's true. Well, thank Congratulations. You. Yeah. Well, thank you for the, for the kind introduction. Um, so I, I, I'm going to fess up to everyone. This talk was a little challenging to create because I assume, based on me going to these, these seminars for the past year, that this is not a talk that is... Uh, like many MPC talks. <laughs> so um, for those of you who came for a detailed tour of how to create programming languages, you're going to be disappointed. <laughs> for everybody else other than those two people, I think you'll probably like it a little bit more. So I try to keep the details to a minimum. If you guys, uh, if anybody in, in the audience is actually interested in the details, shoot me an email. We can go out for coffee and I'm, I'm willing to dive in as deep as you want. Um, so the title of my talk is Building a Language for Expressing Spatial and Temporal Methods in a Supercomputer. I'm, uh, I'm going to start my timer. So I used to, as a graduate student, go under on my time, but I found that as the years progress as a professor, I get later and later. So I'm going to add a timer to make sure that everybody can get out of here on time. Um, so what I want to talk about today is starting pretty high level picture about what it is that I do in my research area, which is called CyberGIS. Uh, it stands for Cyber Infrastructure Based Geographic Information Science and Systems. And we're basically going to start from that high level uh, perspective and kind of zoom in to what it is I want to talk about today. Uh, we'll start by talking about a first language that I made called Parallel Cartographic Modeling Language, PCML. We'll talk about forest, the new language I'm going to talk about today, which is kind of the core focus of the talk. And then a uh, wonderful experience over the summer, working with two uh, MPC diversity fellows who really put forest into practice, and then talk a little bit about the future. Uh, before I get going, I do want to say interruptions are fine. If somebody has a question, uh, feel free to just jump in. You don't even have to raise your hand. Otherwise, I should have 15 minutes left over if you guys want to ask questions at the end. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty flexible and easygoing. Uh, so what is, cyber or what is cyber infrastructure before we even get to cyber GIS? Uh, it was actually termed by uh, NSF, National Science Foundation, Blue Ribbon Advisory Panel. And they, they kind of uh, compared it to traditional infrastructure. So that, that term was coined and has kind of been used since the 1920s to refer to roads, power grids, bridges, rail lines. Um, it's basically everything that an industrial economy needs to function, right? So this is something that's familiar to everybody. And generally, we think of good infrastructure as being invisible. You really only notice it when it disappears, when the lights don't come on, when the water stops flowing. Construction, <coughs> huh? down 35W, yeah? <laughs> um, so, so we really only notice it uh, when it breaks. But it's really some of the most complex and expensive things that we build. So the US interstate highway system, power grids, all very, very expensive to maintain. Uh, now we have this newer term uh, called cyber infrastructure. And it refers to infrastructure based on distributed computer information and communication technologies. So if we compare that to traditional infrastructure, we can say that kind of the traditional factory uh, and power line infrastructure is really based on an industrial economy. And cyber infrastructure is what they say is required for a knowledge economy for the 21st century. And it's really uh, this area that most of my research uh, goes under. Uh, I'm not going to go through this quote, thankfully. Uh, so cyber infrastructure can be thought of in terms of kind of three layers. You have communities, such as MPC, sandwiched between cyber infrastructure and base technology. So this is the computers, the network cables, and everything else. Cyber infrastructure sits in between communities and these base technologies in order to get something done. The community of my interest is geographic information science. This is kind of my, my people, right? My, my research area. Uh, and then within this is cyber GIS, right? 
Uh, I can go into a lot of technical jargon for CyberGIS, but for, for this talk and generally how I like to introduce it in an interdisciplinary research context is going through kind of a big picture approach. Um, so how I like to introduce CyberGIS is we have groups and individuals leveraging cutting edge technologies to study or solve geographic problems, right? No technical jargon. So hopefully I'm gonna keep everybody awake while you eat your lunch, so we'll see. If we remove the, the cutting edge technologies, we can compare that to traditional research, right? So we have groups and individuals studying or solving geographic problems. So it's really that technology that's the core focus here. And that technology does a couple of things. On the human side, it can enhance collaboration. And I think that's something that MPC, a lot of the IPM star <laughs> um, projects are doing is really leveraging these technologies in order to build a 100,000 user kind of strong base of researchers uh, around the world, right? So I think it's just a testimony of what technology can do. Technology is also going out into the world. We have satellites, we have digital sensors, the advent of smart cities. We're starting to collect a lot of data on people in the environment. And what's interesting about all of this technology going out into the world is it's actually shifting the problem from what we were originally trying to solve to what do we do with all of this data? So now as satellites come in, we're gathering more and more and more data, suddenly the, the, the problem can shift to, whoa, I don't know what I can do with all of this data. How do we actually handle it? And that's where uh, I come in and I actually become a little bit more interested in whatever somebody else is trying to solve usually. So uh, as, as was mentioned, uh, my research varies quite a bit. So I do social media data analytics with Twitter, uh, I do human origins research, I do risk research, um, I do environmental research, I kind of move about wherever the interesting problems are that have big data sets. Um, and what I do, and other people like me, is we apply high performance computing. We use supercomputers in order to tackle some of these problems. We use big data storage, geovisualization techniques in order to help people make sense of these data. Right? So we're talking about spatial analytics, spatial modeling, uh, things like agent-based modeling. I also do uh, disease modeling. That was my dissertation research. Uh, and we generally use high performance computing. So we use these supercomputers which can tackle these large problems um, uh, very effectively. Now, of course, once you have a supercomputer, it's not like you can go up and touch it, right? So generally, these things are sitting in large rooms that are generally refrigerated, um, and they have usually, you know, security people sitting in front of them and everything else. So you can't directly touch them. So then what we do is we build software tools and services in order to interface with this. And this, again, is IPM star, right? So there's a lot of infrastructure, there's a lot of data sitting here, and and data centers elsewhere, and people are using uh, websites, web services in order to get access to it. So it's a perfect example. But this whole spectrum uh, is basically the area that I work in. We call it cyber GIS. And if we zoom into the systems level, what's kind of uh, undergirding some of these technologies and what does that look like? I can go through piece by piece, but I'm just going to give kind of a high level overview uh, of what it is that cyber GIS kind of looks like. On the left hand side we have um, devices so people can interface, you know, cell phones, laptops, desktops, generally through the web. And they interface from a web portal like a website, right? You can also connect these things to other services, other platforms out there, web mapping, spatial data infrastructures, other uh, similar services, right? This is where my social media data analytics research comes in. I have another project where we're collecting um, couple of million tweets a day. Um, we've accumulated a few billion tweets over the course of a couple of years that we use to do uh, analysis for risk research, right? So we're not actually going and downloading these things. This is computers basically pulling, using web services to pull that data automatically from Twitter. The meat of it, the meat of what it is that we do is spatial databases, which store all of our spatial data and the computational components, the GIS methods, the spatial analysis methods, the spatial middleware. And this is kind of what we want to focus on for the talk today. And what powers these things are big data storage and supercomputers. So uh, I'm affiliated with a National Science Foundation project called EXCEED. It stands for Extreme Science and Engineering Discovery Environment. It funds a number of supercomputing centers around the world, or around the US, uh, and gives us free access to supercomputers. So this is kind of where a lot of my research takes place. 
But I want to focus most of uh, this talk on the computational components. How is it that we can actually make use of these supercomputers in order to look at this geospatial data? So in short, tell something like this. This is a supercomputer at the Texas Advanced <coughs> Computing Center. Um, it's called Stampede. They just upgraded it. It has a few hundred thousand processing cores, whereas the desktop computer at this presentation is running on probably has two or four, right? It's just a little bit bigger. Um, and we want it to be able to analyze data stored on this. This is the TAC Ranch data store. It stores petabytes and petabytes of storage uh, of data. Um, and this is basically what we're trying to do. The core of what it is that I'm trying to do is make this easy. Right, to be able to leverage all of the processing cords or many of the processing cords in this supercomputer to chug through data that's sitting on something like that. So that's what I do. <laughs> Luckily for everyone here, I'm not going to go into the technical details. We're going to go high level. So again, if anybody's interested in the technical details, the source code's available or uh, I'll take you out to coffee. I'd love to di dive into the details because that's where I you know, really uh, get, get a lot of my excitement in terms of research. Uh, in terms of programming, one very popular programming language is called Python. So has anybody heard of Python? Wow, okay, fantastic. This is my crowd more than I thought even. This is good. Uh, so Python we call a general purpose programming language. So we can solve lots of different problems. It's very easy to use, very easy to learn. It's taking research world by storm, the general industry by storm because it's easy enough and it's good enough to solve a lot of problems, basically. If you're interested, I have a couple of links. There's lots of online resources to learn it. Um, I teach it in my classes. Primarily for me, Python is becoming the language for GIS. So most, I would argue, geography GIS courses, at least in the US, teach Python now. Um, and most of the GIS software packages and tools now have a Python interface. So if you want to do programming in GIS, generally you're going to learn and use Python. So this is kind of the, the programming language for GIS. Now the problem with Python is if we have a supercomputer and it has thousands and thousands of processing cores, each of these boxes, and you program in Python how most people learn how to program, which is the traditional way, serial programming, you can use one of these processing cores, right? You learn how to program, but you learn how to program one processing core. So if you have a supercomputer, that's some wasted power, arguably, right? So, um, so this causes a problem. We have to introduce some other type of programming, and we call this parallel programming. So this is a special type of programming that enables multiple tasks to be performed simultaneously. So you can fill in this grid with all red boxes, right, is the goal. Now, as you can imagine, parallel programming is hard. So I've been doing this for, for a long time now. Uh, my background is in computer science, and I was always interested in this problem. Uh, and the issue is, is that, you know, doing things simultaneously causes lots of problems. Uh, both theoretically in computer science as well as real-world problems trying to chug through spatial data. Um, and, it, and it takes a lot of time. So there is a solution uh, that some people have proposed, and I apologize, I'm actually quoting myself here, so I'm cheating a bit. Um, <laughs> uh, this is based on my, my earlier work with, with PCML, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But uh, we have something that's called a domain-specific language. So rather than a general purpose language like Python, these domain-specific languages are custom tailored for a specific domain. Uh, it could be a science domain, it could be an application domain. And what they offer is a very expressive power for one domain, uh, and it allows us to mask the complexities of parallel from the users. So this is important because then parallel programming becomes much easier if we can basically hide all of the complexities. So then the question is, how do we create a programming language that limits the scope to your particular domain so we have a limited scope and kind of custom tailor it so that it fits that specific domain very well? This is essentially what we're trying to do, right? Uh, my first stab at this, oh yeah, I. Uh, for those of you who don't want to pay attention to all of those technical details, uh, if, we, if we have Python, right, it's like this ridiculously expensive Swiss Army knife that does a little bit of everything, right? But the problem is, is if you want to use any one of those tools, 
You have to use a Swiss Army knife that's about yay wide, right? <coughs> the domain-specific language does one thing and it does it well, right? So the question is, is how well can we design that bottle opener for spatial temporal problems? That's essentially all that I've been working on for the past while. Um, so my first stab at this was PCML. This uh, started off as an interdisciplinary project. Um, I ended up taking over and then we, we moved on it for a while. And it was actually in part MPC that made me abandon it uh, and switch <laughs> over to, to the other, to, to, to a new language. Um, the overall goal of PCML was to lower barriers to entry for geospatial computing. So basically what I've been trying to do for, for some time. It was created based on three design criteria. We wanted it to be, to have good usability. We want it to be easy to use for anybody, uh, particularly students. Uh, we want to have good programmability, so easy to develop new methods in the, me in the language, as well as kind of advance the, the language itself. We also wanted it to be scalable, so we want to be able to handle big data. So that was kind of, kind of the overall goal. I'm not going to go into the details, but it was based on something that's called cartographic modeling. If you're a geographer, you've heard of it, it's everywhere in GIS. Um, it's, effect it's affectionately known as map algebra in its simpler cases. Um, the language was developed in Python, and it supported something that's called automatic parallelization. In computer science, this is the holy grail of, um, of parallel computing. Basically, what automatic parallelization is, is the user doesn't have to talk about, touch, understand, implement, write, anything related to parallel programming, right? So PCML hid all of the parallel processing behind the scenes from the user. They could play with it if they wanted to, but there was nothing in PCML that required a user to actually do parallel programming. It all happened behind the scenes, and you got it for free. Uh, so this was a major uh, advance in terms of GIS, which I think was very interesting. Uh, it's open source, so if you're interested, you can pull the source code, you can take a look at it, it's all free. Um, and what PCML focused on is one of two ideas that geographers and GI scientists really focus on. So GI scientists are a lot like physicists. So they see the world in one of two possibilities. Either objects or fields. So objects we like to call vectors. So we have points, lines, and polygons. Points, dots on a map. Lines, the center of a stream. Polygons, the outline of a state, of a country, US census tract, right? So it kind of looks like this. So this is one view of our world, is our vector. Raster is a two-dimensional grid where each cell in the grid can have a particular value. And this is basically the only way that geographers and GI scientists think. Um, it's kind of like either having a particle or a wave if you're a physicist. And PCML was based on raster, so it was very good with raster data. So it could tackle a wide range of raster-based um, Methods, it, you can implement a number of methods in it. Local operations, focal operations, zonal operations, and global operations. Not going to go into the details. If you're interested, feel free to ask a question, uh, either now or at the end. Um, but it could tackle a bunch of different raster problems. So the simplest example that we can come up with uh, to look at this is we can do what's called a local sum. So if we have a very small 2 by 2 raster, you can take the um, value in this cell, add it to the value in this cell, and we output it to the value in this cell. Literally 1 plus 2 is equal to 3, right? We repeat that, taking the values of the cells at the exact same location and putting it in the output. And you can do lots of cool GIS stuff using something as simple as that. Um, a lot of research has been done on this type of stuff for decades. Uh, obviously they get a little more complex than just 1 plus 2 is equal to 3. But that's the base of it. Underneath, PCML um, took what we call these, these raster data layers, so basically kind of these two-dimensional grids. We would break them up into something that we call subdomains. Just think of them as little chunks, little pieces of that layer. We'd automatically schedule them across multiple processing cores. So this is where this automatic parallelization comes into play. And then we basically do all of the, the, the computing down here, right? So again, I'm not going to go into the details, um, but that, that was essentially the process. We hid all of this from the user. So the only thing the user had to do was program the particular function, the I want to add this value to this value. All of this stuff was behind the scene and hidden from the user, which was, which was um, actually quite powerful. 
it scaled pretty well. Um, this is what we call an efficiency graph. So as we go from one to two to four to eight to 16 cores, so not even very many cores yet, uh, it was maintaining what we call 80% efficiency. So we lost 20% to overhead and technical stuff that I'm not going to get into, which is actually pretty good. Um, I would say most GIS methods in the published literature are down here in the 20 to 30, sometimes the 50%. So uh, us achieving 80% even at 16 cores was, was pretty good, and I think that there's room to improve that. And that's what Forrest is going to work on. So it was a good start. The problem was I switched uh, and started talking to MPC, and they wanted to have a new method called zonal mean. So zonal mean is used in IPAM's Terra. And basically what it is, is if you have a raster data set, let's say you want to know what's the average precipitation in Minnesota. Okay, You have a raster data set with precipitation values everywhere across the state. And then you have the outline of the state of Minnesota. What you can do, it's a very simple method. You add up all of the cells that are inside the state of Minnesota and you divide it by the number of cells. That's the zonal mean. I mean it's about as easy as local sum. The problem was that PCML was based on raster and vector is very different. So it actually broke the underlying assumptions of the language itself. Um, it also couldn't handle time very well. Um, and something called multi-pass algorithms, things like standard deviation. You go through all the values to get the mean. You have to go through all the values again, comparing them against the mean. That's what we call a multi-pass algorithm. So you're going through the data multiple times. If you see this, it's very linear, right? So some of these methods were starting to actually break the underlying assumptions of the language, which gave us automatic parallelization. Uh, but it started causing problems. So in short, PCMO was too narrow. We, we made a bottle opener that like, could only open a few bottles, right? So that like, didn't, didn't really work for a lot of the research problems. So in comes uh, Forrest. So I was at this point uh, about now, last year. We were talking about it. I was trying to shove it into PCML and was struggling with it a little bit. And then in my PhD seminar class last spring, I started talking to the students uh, and some of the folks here at MPC about maybe talking about a new language. And some of the students decided to go for it. So over the course of that semester, last spring, we actually started designing a new language. We started talking about the fundamentals of space-time data and building up from there. And what we came up with was what we call FORES. It's a language for expressing spatiotemporal computing. The high-level goal is to make spatiotemporal computing on supercomputers easy, right? Now, easy, not easier, but easy is the goal. And I don't necessarily talk about raster or vector. We're not stuck to any one particular model, so it's a much more generic kind of uh, language compared to PCML. My secret goal in all of this, of course, is to make my research and teaching easier. That's what I, <laughs> that's what I want. So I spend a lot of time programming and doing all of this technical stuff in order to solve interesting problems. If I can stop spending so much time trying to get just the stuff to work on the supercomputers, I can go on to more interesting things. Um, so, so some of my secret goal is actually just to make my life easier, right? Um, and before I jump into the language and all of the details, just, I'm just kidding. I'm not actually going to go into the details of all the language. Um, I am going to talk about the four primary components, what make up the language and what make the innovations possible and why I think that this language is going to be a little bit of a game changer for some of the things that I do. Before I jump in, does anybody have any questions? Overwhelmed everybody so far? Yeah? Good. I'm, no. <laughs> Everybody's quiet. Yeah? What uh, supercomputers are you linked up to? Sorry if you missed it, but you mentioned this. No, no, no. no. Um, so it, I, I'll be honest, it depends on the project. <laughs> Um, so I have access and have been conducting research on about, let's see, so, so Ranger, uh, which is then turned to Stampede, uh, Bridges, which is the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, um, Jetstream, which is at, uh, it's split between Indiana and 
TAC, which is the Texas Advanced Computing Center. There's also Roger, which is a, a supercomputer actually for CyberGIS, um, and Comet, which is at San Diego Supercomputing Center. So five are kind of the primary ones, and then there's, there's a few other ones that, are, that we have access to. Uh, one that MPC actually has access to is, is Wrangler, which is a data analytics supercomputer at TAC as well. Um, so David Haynes uh, and I are, were working on Wrangler, and now we're moving over to Bridges. So we actually match the problem to the supercomputer. It's a good question. Any other questions before I jump in? I'm really not going to go into the details of how to build a language, so I, I, I decided to stay with pictures mostly. I'll show an example. Um, all right, so four elements of spatiotemporal computing. The first one is, of course, the spatial temporal data itself, right? Uh, in computer science, in GIS, we call these data models. Decades and decades of research go into how do we actually represent spatial data, right? So this is where a lot of the work goes. Computation, computer scientists call these algorithms. Again, decades and decades and decades of, of research go into how do we effectively write code and do the mathematics so that we can effectively go through all of this data and do something interesting with it, right? These are our GIS methods, our spatial statistics, these sorts of things. All get written as algorithms so that the computer can understand what it is that we do. This is where most of the research has occurred in the past decades. And I think what's missing are actually these bottom two which is where I focus most of my research on. Underneath these algorithms, we can also talk about the flow of computation. Uh, at the high level, we call these workflows. So how is it that you actually combine these algorithms together to solve something interesting? So generally, we don't just use um, one algorithm to solve a problem. So in GIS, we tend to use multiple methods, sending data to and from these methods in order to solve a more complex problem, right? Just like in statistics, you tend not to use, you know, one statistical method and then you're done, right? You generally kind of look at the data from a number of different perspectives. But also within these algorithms, we have a lot of repetition. So as I've been developing uh, spatial analytics and spatial models, I found that my computer code ended up looking very similar from one method to the next, right? Sometimes up to 90% overlap in code, uh, which is a little inefficient if you think about it. So a lot of the energy and effort in terms of computation flow is just redundancy. So if we can actually study how these algorithms are actually implemented underneath, and how they link together, we can eliminate some of that redundancy by just studying how they interconnect, right? Uh, and by doing that, we save ourselves a lot of time, and we also, on the computation side, give us a lot of opportunity to improve performance, so it's kind of a win-win. On the other side, we also have the flow of data. So this isn't how to represent data, this is how to get data from one place to another. So in computer science, we call that input and output. Reading and writing data becomes a huge problem when you're talking about gigabytes and gigabytes and petabytes and petabytes of data. So this actually is becoming a key problem in GIS and geospatial data processing, is just getting the data there. Uh, the other one is communication. So in parallel and high performance computing, we call this interprocessor communication. So if you have a, all those processing cores, they need to coordinate sometimes. They need to be able to pass data to each other. And they do that through communication. So trying to study and to actually express how this data is flowing from one processor <coughs> to the next is another piece of the puzzle that a lot of people haven't actually focused on. And I think that these two pieces are the reason why domain-specific languages <coughs> become so powerful for a particular domain is because you can kind of really tackle and hone in on what's going on behind the scenes. And it's missed a bit when people are only studying the traditional data models and algorithms. So again, this is kind of what we're focusing on. So I'm going to go through each one uh, step by step. And I promise I'm not showing very much computer code at all. So I mentioned that kind of GI scientists <coughs> see the world as one of two possibilities, objects and fields, or vector and raster data. In my research, social media data analytics, we also work with text. We also work with 
social networks that have a spatial component to it. So we're actually missing some data and something that GIS uh, systems have been struggling with for years is how to deal with time. So when you only think about raster and vector, there's all this other stuff that you actually miss. So one of the things that we were interested in when we were developing this language is how do you actually design for everything, right? And that's what we started focusing on. And what students and I came up with is affectionately known as Bob. <laughs> it stands for a spatio-temporal bounded object. Uh, one of the grad students came up with Bob, the name. We had a, a, a bit of a discussion as to what we should call this thing. I was going for box, but I, I, I have to admit I like Bob a little bit better. So um, the idea with a Bob is that it can encapsulate pretty much all of the space-time data that we tend to work with. It has six basic attributes. It has an x and a y point, which is basically the origin. It has a height, it has a width, as a start time and a duration. You're bounding all of the data spatially and temporally, right? Notice we're not talking about what type of data that we're working with, we just have a bounds. This bounds gives us a very generic data structure that the language can work with, and we can adapt to a number of different data types. So we've implemented raster, we've implemented some of the vector, we've implemented space-time points, uh, we had a play with timelines. Uh, I have a student that's going to be working on text pretty soon. It's very easy to basically add these very specific data types based on a bob, right? But the language itself only has to care about what a bob is. Yeah. So I have a question about how um, time works with bobs. So if you had something like precipitation uh, by month and you had many, I don't know, 12 months of, of data, would you have 12 bobs then? Or would bob be divided into like 12 bits, one for each month. That's a fantastic, so it depends, actually. And this is where the language starts to get complex. So a space-time cube could hold multiple kind of snapshots of a raster data set. So for ex exactly right. So if you have temperature precipitation data that's snapshot, you could put that into a space-time cube where each slice of the cube is a month. <coughs> So then it's all encapsulated into one. Now, of course, you could add transformers that could s take a slice of that and turn it into a raster data set, right? Because maybe you only care about one month. So you're actually storing the data as a year. You use a transformer that steals a slice, and then it becomes a raster, right? Or you have a raster data set. You want to apply zonal mean, and then you get a polygon. Right? So we can develop methods that will basically steal one data type and can transform it into a different data type. Or you could go the other way. Maybe you have a set of rasters that you've read in that are monthly, and then you make a space-time cube. So you can basically shove them all together. Right? So the language gives you that flexibility in order to move data types between themselves, as long as you have a method that enables you to do that translation. Does that answer the question, hopefully? Yeah. Any other questions so far? No? So now that we have our data, we add what we call a primitive. Uh, this is the basic unit of computation. This is where your algorithms go, right? So primitives, very generically, accept one or more bobs as input, and they produce one or more bobs as output. <coughs> That's its definition. So for the language, a primitive is really a black box. And Forest actually doesn't care what goes on here. That's up to the user. That's up to the developer to do GIS, spatial statistics, some sort of a transformer that takes that space-time cube and turns it into a raster. Forest doesn't care because it's just going to run this and then get its output, right? And uh, so it gives us a lot of flexibility. So the language itself, since the only thing that we're paying attention to is bobs, you can come up with a new data type, and the language never has to change. So it allows us to be very flexible with solving new data problems. So we have data. We have computation. What about computation flow? How do we actually make the data move from something like a primitive to another primitive, right? How do we actually make sure that the data uh, in the computation is moving forward? Here we're stealing uh, an idea from workflow patterns, and we just made it general, and we called it a pattern. 
So um, in computer science literature, we have something that's called workflow patterns, different ways that you can basically connect the ins with the outs of things like primitives. Uh, so this is an example of a sequence. You're basically taking the output of a primitive, you're passing it to the input of a primitive, getting that output, passing it in, right? So we're just, that's called a sequence. Forest supports a number of other patterns. We have a split where we can take a bob and we can split it up. Notice here we have the advantage of having space-time bounds. We can take a slice of space, and whatever data fits in the upper slice goes up there. Whatever, whatever data fits in the lower slice goes down there. Again, the language itself doesn't necessarily care what the data is. It just wants to know how it gets sliced, and it lets the, the developer handle that. We have a merge, where we basically bring it all back together into a primitive. We have cycles. So we can basically repeat the same thing over and over again. This is good for spatial statistics, things like Monte Carlo simulations or certain spatial models. And the messy one is synchronization. So when you're running in parallel or um, you're doing things simultaneously, sometimes we have to exchange data. We call that synchronization. So we have to kind of pass these bobs from this primitive down to this primitive and, and over. Right? So these are just kind of common workflow patterns that occur in parallel computing regardless. And these are the ones that are supported by Forest. By supporting these basic types, you can actually build up into more complex types. I'm not going to go into the details of that because that even makes my eyes water, to be honest. So <laughs> that's not really the exciting part for me. Uh, so this is going to be one of two bits of code that I'm going to show. This is traditionally how one would learn to program in Python to apply a local sum operation, like I showed you for PCML, to two data sets. So four lines of code. I'm not going to go into the details, but basically these first two lines read in a data file. One's called raster A, one's called raster B. This one applies the local sum function. So this is actually does the, applies the algorithm, right? Applies the code, raster A, raster B. We get an output. And then we write that to an output file, right? So it's as simple as you get, four lines of code. Then the question becomes, if you want to use a supercomputer, if you want to go from that one red dot to filling up the grid, can we do this in parallel, right? So rather than just doing A to B, what we want to do is split it all up, run these things in parallel, run the local sum in parallel, get the partial outputs, and then merge them all back together. Those four lines, I can tell you, become a lot more than four lines of code. I'm not going to show them all to you. Um, the problem is that, that when we add parallelism, the traditional way really breaks down. And this is what motivated the language. So how is it that we can do better in Forest? And this is where the students and I spent some time, and, um, and then I gave some, some whiteboard time just kind of thinking through, thinking through the process. And what we do is give each workflow pattern a particular syntax. So we have sequence. If you're a programmer, I put in, in, in parentheses the, the comparison operation. So for those of you who aren't programmers, just, just ignore it. It's fine. So sequence is two equal signs. In programming uh, lingo, we call it equal to. Um, split is less than. Merge is greater than. Cycle, the start of a cycle is less than or equal to. The end of a cycle is greater than or equal to. And synchronization with all the messy stuff is exclamation point equal sign. So notice how pictorially merge kind of captures what's going on. So we can kind of see a visual reminder that, oh, we're splitting up the data, oh, we're merging it back together, right? We can take that and actually put that into a programming language. This is that same four lines, except for in parallel. I realize that that's really tiny, so I zoomed in. So we can do read, pass it a sequence, so we're reading in A, we're doing a sequence, and we're stacking it up with B. We're splitting the data here. So now we have multiple data going on. This is the parallel section. We're applying local <coughs> sum. This is the screen section. We're merging the stuff back together, and we're writing the output. That's a one, what we call a one-liner uh, in, in programming that does parallel programming, right? Notice there's no complexity. If you're learning how to program, it's not any more difficult, I would say, than any other programming language. So what happens behind the scenes? If this was a different talk, 
This is where I would go into 30 minutes of technical detail of how we actually do this. But I'm not going to do that today. Um, behind the scenes, each of these little syntax workflow patterns has some code behind it. And this is what we basically stole from PCML. This split automatically will take spatial data, it'll break it apart, it'll shove it out to a bunch of processing cores to run in parallel until it hits a merge, and then the merge brings it all back together. Right? So behind the scenes, we have these what we call engines, and you can implement different engines depending on the different supercomputer that you're running on. We have three really basic engines running right now, a pass engine, which really doesn't do anything. Uh, it's actually mostly for testing. We have a tile engine which splits the data into tiles, so it just kind of slices up the data. We have a multi-processing engine that takes those tiles and runs them in parallel. I have uh, two students right now that are working on more powerful engines that are going to scale up uh, to larger and larger data sets. What's important about the engines is the code never changes. So we can write new engines, take this exact same code, and run it on a different supercomputer and get different performance characteristics. We can scale it to bigger problems without actually having to change any of the code, which is, which is kind of a, a nice addition in terms of time savers, right? Uh, I was talking about that a little bit before. Again, I'm not going to go into the technical details. If you're interested in the technical details, please send me an email and I'll take you out to coffee because there's very few people who actually care about this stuff, so I want to find you and I want to, and I want to talk to you. So, uh, so I'll take you out to coffee. So now we solve computation flow using these patterns and then we're left over with data flow. Um, we're still searching for an elegant solution, short, short answer. So we have something that actually works. Um, I would say it's not very elegant, so I wanted to do a little bit better. The goal of data flow is that it hides complexity just like we achieved for these workflow patterns. So we want something that is as easy as this, that captures how data is actually flowing through this system. It's very easy to solve these black arrows. This is done. This is, this is super easy. It's these red arrows that pass data from here and skip it over here, pass this data and skip it over here. When sometimes you're in parallel, sometimes you're not, sometimes you start in parallel and then you're not in parallel. So we have a couple of good ideas here, uh, but nothing that is actually implemented. So this is uh, still ongoing, so ask me back and I'll talk about it next time, at least in the high level. Yeah. When you're um, splitting up something, um, is the, are both the dimension of how big the data set <coughs> is that you start with, like how many observations, and how many processors that you can run it on? Do both of those govern? They certainly can. I mean, right now we have, um, it's kind of a simplish parameter that matches you up to the number of cores. And this is actually what some of the MPC diversity fellows were doing. Um, in the future, we'll definitely be adding a little bit more, um, I would say, logic and kind of smartness. Uh, to the system because sometimes it's actually not worth it to add parallelism at all because there's overhead to it. In order to get all of this stuff launched up and running and split, sometimes the data is so small that you actually don't want to do that. So we'll probably have a threshold that says if your data is this small, just, just do it like normal because it actually goes slower if you try to do all of that. Now, if your data is so big, we might have a different threshold that says, well, we have to do this other thing entirely. Um, we're not there yet, um, but that's certainly something that, that's going into consideration, yeah. Okay, I have a few minutes left, so um, I want to talk a little bit about this summer and um, thank the MPC uh, for running a wonderful program. So for those of you who haven't heard about it, the MPC Diversity Fellows program is fantastic. So I was a faculty mentor to two very talented students, uh, Louie and Julina. Um, one's a graduate student, one's an undergraduate student. Um, my project, which was titled Toward Transforming Geocomputing in IPAMS Terra, uh, was funded, and MPC provides funding to support these students to work uh, eight weeks for the undergraduate student and 10 weeks for the graduate student. Um, and if you're interested in what they worked on in a little more detail, um, they were the project was highlighted in an IPAMS blog post. But um, what I kind of want to do is just show what those students worked on in those eight short weeks 
mostly as a little bit of an advertisement to how awesome Forrest is, right? <laughs> no, actually, it, a lot of it is how good these students are. Um, so these students, uh, one of them's in computer science and one's in CFANS. Um, so they weren't geography GIS students, right? Um, they hadn't heard, well, they've heard of IPAM's Terra, both of them, but hadn't extensively used it. So in the first couple of weeks, they had to learn something called Jupyter Notebooks, which is a kind of a new uh, programming platform. They, they learned about IPAM's Terra. They had to learn about Forest, which of course they'd never heard of because like it basically didn't exist before them really working on it very heavily. Um, and they learned how to profile code. So code profiling is how we can identify the fast parts in code and the slow parts in code. And what this project was, was trying to speed up zonal mean to start off with. So that thing that broke PCML um, and forced me to jump languages, they were working on how to make that uh, method a lot faster. Um, so in the first couple of weeks, they were learning Forest. Then they started talking about how can we speed up this method, right? They spent a couple of weeks doing that. And then we started talking about parallelizing code. And before they even got to parallelization, they made some significant performance improvements for the algorithms, right? And this was all in Forest. And then we parallelized the code. They got some more performance. And then, of course, they, we ran out of time and they had to do their presentation. They're actually still working with us, um, still working with me and David Haynes, and we continue working on it. But uh, in eight short weeks, they learned the language. They actually improved the language itself. Their changes are now on GitHub. Uh, and they improved the performance of the method. How much? I'm not going to go into the details, but basically a test data set took almost two minutes to run. Their first uh, profiling optimization, profiling optimization, got it down to 18 seconds. Then we did it in parallel with Forrest a little bit more. They got it down to 8.8 .8 seconds. So going from about two minutes to eight seconds, as we scale up the data, which is basically all in IPAM's Terra, suddenly these multi-hour runs that we're hitting go down to seconds or minutes. So that was accomplished in eight weeks with students who had never heard of the language or anything at all. So imagine what they're going to hopefully be able to accomplish uh, this semester. So I think that it gives uh, some interesting possibilities. So future, it's bright. Of course, I'm optimistic, right? I'm an assistant professor whose tenure case is riding on a lot of this. So I have to, <laughs> I have to think that the future is bright. Um, so it's very much under active development. I have a uh, number of students are actually contributing to it. And all of their code has kind of diverged out. So this semester, I've been working on bringing it all back into a single code base. Um, it's free. It's available if you want. Uh, links are there. Uh, we have a lot more in the pipeline. So some of the stuff you actually can't see on GitHub yet. One's in a private repository here at Minnesota that I'm trying to make public. Um, basically, Forest is, is doing OK. It seems to tackle some, some interesting problems. We're getting some good performance um, improvements. We need to tackle data flow. So I'm going to go back and stare at a whiteboard for a while longer, trying to get, trying to get that to work. Um, importantly, we're developing more methods and models. We're looking for use cases. So if something in uh, MPC seems to kind of fit this, if you're kind of struggling with um, kind of a, a spatial analytics or a modeling problem, and you want to test out for us, I'll take you out to coffee and we can talk about it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so free, uh, free advertisement. Uh, acknowledgement, certainly uh, MPC. Uh, you know, they funded the diversity fellows. They, they've been a wonderful collaborator of mine. Um, the, the two diversity fellows, uh, Louis and Julina, I also have been working with two undergraduate students over the summer. Uh, a number of graduate students, including my Cyber GIS seminar, who really kind of sparked um, a lot of this. And with that, hopefully, I didn't completely overwhelm everyone, but I would like to thank you for your attention and not falling asleep. No, okay, no one's asleep yet. So thank you very much, I appreciate it. Do I have any questions or did I overwhelm everyone? <laughs> so once Forest is designed and we've got this language, what what's the hard part that's left? Like is it hard to actually get it to run on all these different supercomputers? Like what, what has to be customized to be able to run it in lots of different environments? So I'll give you a short answer and a long answer. The the, the short answer is nothing. 
um, in theory. So once you have the base engine that works, it'll run on most supercomputers. To custom tailor it to a machine, that takes time. Um, so, so generally, if you, if you run just very generically on a supercomputer, you get maybe like 80% of what the supercomputer is probably capable of, right? And then in order to get that last 20, just like in everything else in life, you spend a lot of energy. Um, but to get to that 80%, I think we can get there by the end of the semester. It'll just run on most of these supercomputers. Uh, and then tweaking it beyond that just, it depends. You know, that last 20% sometimes takes years. <laughs> um, some of which might hopefully become a PhD dissertation if I can find the right student. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so that's, that's the, the short and the long answer. Yeah. Uh, maybe, it, maybe this is what it is, but what, can you talk about the decision or the distinction between making your own language versus like creating a Python library or something, kind of what the decision is there? Yeah, so um, the, the computer science term for force is actually an embedded domain specific language. So it's embedded in Python. So it's, it's a, like a super library almost. Um, one of the benefits of a language over a library is we get to take over the syntax. So what you'll notice is in my, my one code example, I try to keep it to a minimum. We overtook um, the comparison operations. So in programming, generally, you can't apply one function to another. This is actually supposed to be is one equal to one, and it's supposed to return true or false. What we're doing in force is we're overtaking a lot of the syntax for our own convenience. So in a library, you couldn't do that. In a library, you're stuck with doing this. You basically spit out a whole bunch of function calls that you can do, and then all of our, all of our force code would basically look like this in a long line. Um, so by doing a language, it gives us the ability to have these, these one-liners. And we can do a lot of things with those one-liners because you can't, because we know that you're not shoving code into the middle of those. And when you shove code into the middle of those, that breaks a lot of stuff. Yeah. If you want more details, we should, we should go out for coffee. <laughs> so are you, um, early on in your presentation, you said there had been a lot of, um, a lot of work developed on algorithms and how to express data and not so much on these two uh, bottom elements and this is what you're working on and what Forrest is trying to address. Is this program one of many in development that's sort of out there competing in the intellectual marketplace yeah. or are you kind of a unique niche um, to tackle these things that were mostly overlooked? Yes and no. So there's certainly other languages libraries that are being developed for GIS. There's, there's quite a few. Um, and even parallel GIS libraries, um, there's quite a few. Uh, if this, I should have, I should have, I, I, I have a different chart that actually does a comparison. So the problem is that if we drew a chart in terms of the technical expertise needed to use those libraries and languages, they actually sit on two opposite ends of the spectrum. On the far right is you have like ArcGIS and everything else that works for anybody that learns how to program. But it can only work with a small subset of like bigger data problems. They're not, it's not really geared for, for big data problems and kind of high performance computing and things. On the other end, with people like me, we work on these software packages and systems. You need to train a student for like a year and you know the dependencies to get the software installed. Um, you know, uh, David Haynes would be a very good person. We have we have a, a transactions in GIS article that just came out, comparing some of the spatial systems. Um, that it it's hard to configure these things. So where Forest is unique is it makes it easier, right? So that's that's where basically my niche is is trying to take something that is messy and trying to turn it into something that's, that's very simple, that I can actually teach undergraduate students. Um, because I think this is kind of the wave of the future. The data is not getting any smaller. So I think that we need to start training people how to actually manage this um, and not the old way. So that's where I think the niche in forest comes into play. Yeah, that's a good question. Any other questions? Can you talk a little bit um, from the projects you worked on? What kinds of projects require the scale of a supercomputer, and 
which you know, uh, you a mentioned small some percentage. Or, I know. So, uh, you know, like, um, and does this help people, you know, parallelize on, you know, not quite supercomputing platforms, but other platforms? Can yeah. You talk a little bit about. Yeah, no, that, no, that's a fantastic question. So um, the number of problems that require supercomputer, very few. Um, I, I, a lot of people come up to me in conferences and things like that and say, I have a really big problem. And uh, you know, they, they, they go through and they talk about their problem. And their problem could be solved with a $5,000 computer that runs for maybe a week, right? That, that's the scope of most people's big, big problems. Um, now, I, I think that there's a long answer that, that I'll come back to, but in terms of uh, the, the language, um, it actually fits very well even for desktop computers. So since about 2005, computers actually aren't getting any faster. Um, there's a bunch of physics behind the reason why, but um, clock speed for computers actually isn't getting any faster anymore. What they're doing is they're actually shoving in more and more cores into these computers. So if you've heard of multi-cores, so if you have a Pentium quad core, or a dual core, a four core, an eight core, they're actually just adding more and more cores. So it used to be the case that every 18 months you buy a new computer and everything was faster. Now that's not the case unless if you use parallel computing. So for example, if you're running traditional software and you have an eight core computer, it's only using one of those cores. So even a language like this will allow you to actually use even just a desktop computer better. I mean, even my cell phone has four cores in it. Right? So this is basically the way that everything's going. So the language actually still even helps you work on the smaller problems just more effectively. Um, so, so I think that that works. And then obviously as you scale up, it, you, know, you get better and better performance or gains. Um, I think one of the things that, all right, I, I, I have a few minutes, so I'll, I'll go into this because I have a captive audience. Um, in terms of the, the, the problems, I actually think one of the things that I've noticed coming from computer science into geography especially, and I don't know if demographers are the same way, so I'm not going to cast you into the same net, but one of the things that I've noticed with geographers, very resourceful, right? Uh, so generally, you, you look at your resources and then you design a project that you can tackle with your resources rather than thinking big. So I think one of the, one of the problems that I've seen, at least working interdisciplinary, is that some people aren't asking big enough questions when they could. Um, so you've generally confined yourself to the tools and technologies of the day, and you've just gotten in that habit. So some people, you know, restrict the questions that they ask to like what they can actually do right now, rather than thinking a little bit bigger and using that to drive some of the science. So it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a, a thing that I have, um, but I think that some people could be tackling some bigger problems. Yeah. So if anybody wants to think outside the box, yeah, let me know. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Well, I'll give us you guys out a few minutes early to enjoy hopefully a slightly less rainy day. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you guys very much. <laughs>